Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So uh, a year is almost over and a new year is about to begin. And I thought it would be really interesting to connect up with two very impressive young ladies who uh, I've come across uh, and talk a little bit about, you know, what, what people of their age group are thinking about in regards to the challenges of the past and the opportunities for the future. And so I want to introduce you to Aaron and uh, is it Courtney? Caitlin. Caitlin, I apologize. That's okay. Aaron and Caitlin Lee, how are the two of you? We're great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, Aaron and Caitlin are both uh, uh, Articlean students uh, on uh, Bay Street uh, with law firms. They both graduated recently from uh, uh, U of T Law School and uh, are uh, launched into the world. Um, and they're interesting. They're twins. Um, and, uh, and they've grew up in a small town in eastern Ontario, and now they're in the big city. Um, so ladies, tell me, what are some of the challenges that, uh, that people your age are faced with right now? So I think COVID, um, the pandemic is obviously, uh, still a major challenge. Um, socially, I think our age group was hit very hard during the pandemic. I know, um, social activities and maintaining a social, um, friend group is very important to young adults specifically. So I think that this was something that our age group definitely struggled with over the past year and continues to struggle with as the um, variants come around and we're trying to navigate the future of the pandemic. Caitlin, I apologize that I uh, mispronounced your name and forgot it. I apologize. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people graduating found it difficult to get jobs that uh, a lot of jobs were deferred or furloughed. Um, and then if they were lucky enough to get a job, um, they didn't get to meet a lot of their their fellow workers until, you know, you know, maybe not at all in 2020 until 2021, the summertime um, when uh, offices opened up again. How did uh, people deal with that? Yeah, I think that's a good point because. Our, our generation is just starting to join the workforce, which is already something um, big to adapt to already. And given COVID, um, I think that that makes it even harder because as you said, we aren't in person all the time and interacting with our bosses or even our colleagues or other students. Um, I know both Aaron and I started our legal careers online. I think that workplaces are doing a good job at trying to bridge that gap and doing as many online social events as possible, which I think we can both agree has really helped us. Online and, social events? What are online social events? Like online holiday parties, online student meetings, online coffee chats, they call them. They're very really? common now. But it's hard. I, you know, I, all that sounds kind of strange to me. I, it's difficult to build a culture in an online environment, isn't it? How do you, don't you need to meet people and get to know them and see them face to face? Yeah. So I think um, technology has really made a significant impact in this realm. For example, um, Teams, I know Teams has had a great expansion since the beginning of the pandemic and even Zoom. Um, rather than just a phone call, I think face to face interaction is very important. Um, and even things like Caitlin was talking about social events. Um, I know that's something that my firm did uh, over last year was um, a cooking class and had a social event with someone from Italy. And they taught us how to make pasta through Zoom in our own homes, which is very Seriously, cool. they connected up with a chef from Italy to teach you how to make pasta. <laughs> From Italy, close to Italy, but no, oh, Italy. not quite. I apologize, I thought it was it. Okay, but that's still kind of cool. Yeah, it was very interesting. And it was a fun way to bring a different culture and um, a fun experience, even though it was just over Zoom. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is this attitude of a gig economy that people are talking about these days, which really means that people aren't going to have the long-term, you know, 20-year careers with one company. Uh, that uh, they may have had in my generation versus your generation, that people are, are going to end up uh, potentially having, you know, numerous different jobs every couple of years. What do you think about that? Is that a big change uh, from your, uh, your mother's uh, generation uh, to today's uh, workforce that you're entering into? 
I think that would definitely be a big change. Um, our parents have worked in the same jobs since we were born, basically. Um, and I know for both Caitlin and I, we are long-term focused at our current job. So hopefully that the, the gig economy doesn't affect our roles. Um, but I think that as a whole, our generation is facing a very different workplace than our parents' generation was. And to add to that, I think that um, the mobility of the current workforce, especially given COVID, um, more jobs are turning online. I hope that actually encourages employers to offer more perks and benefits and better, uh, more livable wages so that employees will want to stay with their uh, the places they're currently working. I hope it makes a better work place for a lot of employees. You know, I think that's a big challenge and uh, maybe we'll take a break and come back and talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, there's been a bunch of articles uh, written about something called the great resignation, uh, which is this attitude that your generation don't put up with, uh, you know, what, what can I call it, but, uh, you know, unfriendly environments nearly as, uh, as, uh, as easily as my generation may have. And, uh, and that people are resigning in mass and looking for new opportunities. And one of the reasons why is that, uh, that potentially during COVID, they had the opportunity to realize they wanted to work at home or they wanted more flexibility or they wanted more work-life balance or they wanted you know, a whole bunch of other potential things that they may not have had the opportunity to see um, prior to COVID. And, uh, and people are resigning in mass unless companies really do a lot of those things that Caitlin, you were just mentioning and making uh, their work environment far more positive. Anyway, we're gonna take a break. Uh, we're chatting tonight with Aaron and Caitlin Lee, twins that are articling students just launched in their careers about what's important um, for, uh, for young people these days. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm uh, introducing you tonight uh, and interviewing two really impressive young ladies, uh, Caitlin, and Aaron Lee, who are both articling students. They've graduated from U of T Law School. Is that correct? U of T Law School? Yes. Recently. Um, and uh, you'll maybe notice that I'm a hockey fan. And I understand that both of you uh, played hockey at university. Is that correct? Yes, we both played at York while we were there for our undergrad. And, uh, and Aaron, you were the defenseman. And uh, Caitlin, you were the winger? Other way around. <laughs> Caitlin was the uh, wing, the defense person, and Aaron was the yeah, winner. yes. And and uh, tell me, how did the two of you get into hockey? Uh, well, we started skating when we were two, and we grew up in a small town called Madoc, and there wasn't a girls team for our age group. So our mom started a girls team at, out of Madoc uh, when we were four years old. Right in? Yeah, four. Okay, yeah. And then so we got into it through her. She actually played hockey growing up and played hockey for the York Lions as well uh, a number of years before us but <laughs> yeah we followed her her legacy and so you uh, started a a women's team and uh, and then how long did you guys play all all your uh, career in Madoc or did you get into some other eastern uh, Ontario league or team yeah, so we moved to Belleville to play pretty um, soon after that because the Madoc team um, it only lasted a couple of years because there weren't enough girls looking to play. So from Belleville, we moved to Peterborough and then eventually to Kingston to play junior there. And that's fantastic. We, uh, Kingston is where we got recruited to play for York. Wonderful. And uh, and what's the biggest tournament you've played in? Um, we played in some in the States or um, like provincials when we were younger. Um, it, there would be a kind of a, um, showdown to get to provincials and we made it there a few times but we never um, never won provincials unfortunately yeah. have you always played on the same team or did you have an opportunity to be opposing each other no no pretty much the same team all the way up we never played against each other but yeah. in scrimmages you get to play defense against offense I guess yeah yeah and in practice and drills which is, is that fun? fun yeah for sure <laughs> we love going against each other <laughs> and and both of you went into law why did you follow each other in uh, sports and in uh, in career? 
Um, I think sports, it was just something fun to always do as a family. Our parents were very involved in our, in our sports career and making sure we got to practices and everything. So that was kind of a family endeavor. Um, and then we were always kind of interested in the same subjects in school, um, did kinesiology together. And then, um, as I've discussed with you previously, ended up in law. Fantastic. Well, you're both uh, very impressive. So thank you so much for joining us. So Kate, yeah. let's come back to this idea of the great resignation, if we could. And you were just before the break talking about how employers had to uh, make better workplaces uh, to keep uh, their employees. And, um, and I guess this idea is that either your generation are more demanding than my generation uh, was um, uh, or is uh, in, uh, in what, uh, what they expect from the workplace what they hope to get from the workplace, uh, or maybe, and, and maybe it's or both, um, COVID-19 has taught us something. Uh, and it's taught us about work-life balance. It's taught us about that we can work from home uh, effectively, that, uh, that we're looking for more from work uh, than just work. And it comes to this attitude of that you don't live to work, but you work to live. Um, that at least is what people have been writing. Um, do you think that whole idea is real? Does it resonate with your experience? Yeah, I think it, I think it does resonate. And I also think that this has to do um, maybe with the laws as well, because we are we do have more rights as employees as we had in the past. And um, maybe social media or the Internet has something to do with that as well, because people now have more knowledge of their rights. Um, so they know what to expect in a workplace so they can stand up for their rights more. There's also something that's recently happened in the law with respect to employment um, where now people, your employers cannot make you respond to work correspondence past a certain time um, because especially with COVID, it was getting very um, negative on people's mental health where employers were expecting people to respond at all hours. Um, and this was- You're saying this of, is a law? Yeah, um, in Ontario or potentially federally, um, they just passed it. So you can't be expected in certain workplaces to respond once your working hours are done. Really, I, I, you know, my, uh, my outlook uh, actually gives me a little uh, notification saying, please consider sending this email Monday morning rather than on the weekend. Um, mm. But I guess uh, this is taking it a whole step farther if you're... Uh, if, if you're saying that there's a law passed that says it's illegal to, uh, to request people or demand that people respond during off, off, off hours. Right. Yeah. It's definitely not in all workplaces um, because it, it simply wouldn't work in a lot of um, areas, but in certain re regulated workplaces, it is now a law and it stems from, there are a few countries in Europe which have had this previously. And I think during the pandemic, it's become a phenomenon more worldwide that people are starting to look at their hours and because people are in their workplaces all the time now if you work at in your kitchen or in your house you never leave the workplace so it's much easier to be responding to emails or other correspondence at all your workplace hours. is your home and so you never leave your uh, place here i am in my uh, right. my home office and uh, <laughs> i don't leave it uh, as often as i used to that's for sure um you know one of the things that people talk about your age group uh, a lot and it's not just you guys it's it's been a problem or an issue for a long time is that uh, people uh, under the age of 30 uh, don't vote um, I think the statistics are that 20 percent of the people under the age of uh, 30 uh, vote and uh, for people above the age of 60 80 percent of them vote 20 percent don't so it's the reciprocal um, what do you think it takes or why do you think so many young people don't vote? I think part of the problem is a lot of young people are away at school, um, which makes it pretty difficult to vote. I know when Caitlin and I went to vote a few years ago at university, it was a challenge to be able to vote and we ended up just going home and voting in our local district there. Um, so I think that's something that definitely challenges young people to be able to vote. Um, but if I think there are ways, obviously, that young people can vote even around these barriers, but it definitely makes it more challenging. What do you think um, we got to do to make sure that people uh, vote, young people vote, other than just allowing them to vote to wherever they live rather than necessarily where they live when they're at home? Anything else we need to do? 
Um, I think something that the NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has really focused on is reaching out to the younger age group um, on social media. And he really gained sort of a following on there. And I know that a lot of young people did um, get to know some of his values through things like, as silly as it might sound, TikTok or Instagram, things like that, that young people are always on social media. So it's easier to reach out to them through this rather so than being on like, TikTok really helps. Seriously? <laughs> I think so. I, I see him pop up on more, my For You page quite often. So I should get a TikTok uh, account if I want to influence uh, people your age group more. Right? Is that the case? <laughs> it might help. Are both of you on TikTok? Uh, we're, we watch TikTok. Um, I create TikToks for her birthday, but that's about it. <laughs> for our birthday, I guess, but for her. <laughs> for, well, I presume you guys share a birthday. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, getting on social media like TikTok, uh, what else? What else can uh, governments, politicians, uh, leaders do to try to stay relevant to people your age? to your generation? Um, I, I guess just having younger and a wider variety of representatives that younger people can relate to. Um, it's sometimes hard for different, for various people, like people of minorities, whether it be based on race, sexuality, um, religious views to um, really care about something if they don't see themselves or someone similar to themselves uh, represented, there. represented in politics. That's interesting. So the Ontario Liberal Party is going to have, they say in this upcoming provincial election, 30 candidates under the age of 30, uh, which would be a substantial number um, relative to the past. In the, in the past, um, you know, the Liberals and the NDP have wanted to have 50% of all their, not 50, 30 or 50, 30%, I think it was, of all their candidates being female. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, uh, undoubtedly, uh, lots of the different political parties have wanted to have um, candidates that are from diverse communities. So you think those efforts work, they help? I think so, yes. And just to add to that, I think something else that could help is having um, more in their platforms for people our age. For example, I know a couple of years ago, um, the tuition issues or loan issues were something that were on a couple of platforms. And I think that this helps make people our age more interested in voting because they see their issues reflected in the platforms. I agree with that. But some people say that it's a chicken and egg. The reality is that because only 20% of you vote, you don't have to have those policies and you cater to the people that vote are the voters. Uh, and so therefore, since 80% of the people above the age of 60 vote, they tend to have a lot of policies that uh, are attracted to them. And, uh, and if that's, you know, who's buying your, your product, that's who you cater to. Uh, and so it ends up being a little bit of a chicken egg uh, challenge in that right. regard, isn't it? So yeah, what that are the makes issues? sense. What are the issues that, uh, that concern the two of you and you think your generation? You know, obviously one of the big... Uh, um, issues in the last little while other than COVID has been climate change and COVID uh, and, and COP26 uh, in Glasgow. I think your sound cut out maybe. Can you still hear me? Oh yeah, we can hear you now, but we lost you for about five seconds there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no, that's okay. I'm just wondering what are the issues that uh, you think you two and your generation are focused on and other than COVID, climate change COP26 was sort of uh, pretty topical. Um, are you guys worried about climate change? Um, yeah, we're both worried about the environment. Um, for example, we both in the past couple of years have cut out um, certain types of meats to try to be easier on the environment. Um, we also look to environmental issues to base who we vote upon. Um, I think other issues, as I've mentioned, would definitely be tuition or things like the government loan program for student loans. Um, also, uh, housing is a big thing for our age group right now. And um, because we are just starting in the workforce in the next coming years, hopefully we will be looking to maybe purchase properties. And right now in Toronto, especially, and even in Ontario more generally, it's very difficult to afford real estate. Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, and Jagmeet Singh, actually, the NDP leader was asked about that during the leaders debate during the last uh, federal election. And he actually, you know, admitted the quandary that um, 
there's a whole bunch of people my age that have built up net worth in their homes and don't really want to have any depreciation in real estate values. But there's a whole bunch of people your age that uh, if we don't do something about real estate prices, we'll never be able to afford to live you know, in Toronto and maybe not even in the 905. You're going to have to go to Madoc to be able to afford a house. Um, <laughs> does that worry you? Yeah, I think it's definitely worrisome for both of us. Um, and like you said, Toronto prices right now, even just renting, um, I know it did, the rental prices did go down somewhat during COVID. Um, but even for some people, renting is prohibitive right now. And um, I don't foresee the Toronto real estate prices dropping anytime soon, unfortunately. So what should the government do? Caitlin, any ideas what the government should do to, to try to make housing more affordable for people like you? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure if there's a straightforward answer to that. I was just, I was going to actually add that on top of the increasing real estate prices that our generation is also plagued by a lot of student debt. So for a lot of people, like Aaron said, buying houses right now is just not foreseeable or even like Aaron said, renting. Um, some people are still at home and entering the workforce because they can't even rent in this market. Yeah, no, there's a, you know, lots of stories have been written about uh, people in their twenties and thirties that are still living in uh, their parents' homes because they can't afford. And that uh, one of the only ways that you can afford a condo or a house in the Toronto marketplace is if you're lucky enough to get uh, a big down payment uh, gift from, uh, from the, the generation ahead of you. Um, so it's a big problem and uh, affordability is a big issue, but, you know, government, shouldn't government have to do something about that? Like you guys deserve the right to be able to buy a house in your, the city that you make your livelihood, don't you? I would agree with that. Um, again, I don't know how they're going to be able to turn this around because it has gotten to such an extreme point. Um, I, I know I've read articles as well about um, years ago, it used to be uh, single income families and they were able to afford a house and provide for their family. But now we could never imagine um, one person making minimum wage, for example, being able to afford, provide the same thing at this time. I think it's a big, I think it's a big issue. And I think it may end up being one of the big issues in uh, the next couple of years as, uh, as climate change has been in the past, I think housing uh, may be one of those uh, and, and, and it's an issue that not only is going to be critically important, but it might be a, a separation between the generations um, uh, that your generation are, are going to be demanding affordable housing. And uh, my generation aren't going to want to risk uh, losing our home equity. So it's one that uh, actually might be, uh, might be a challenge in our societies. We're chatting tonight about the younger generation and, uh, and, and what some of their hopes and dreams and challenges are with Caitlin and Aaron Lee. We're going to take a break. Uh, and come back with more in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Second and 60. I'm having a lot of fun tonight uh, grilling Caitlin and Aaron Lee, uh, two impressive young ladies, and I'm trying to stump them, but so far I haven't been able to, on uh, issues of import to, uh, to people their age. Um, let me... Uh, ask you about another big issue, um, you know, and, and you guys were in school, I guess, so you may not have uh, been as aware of it, but, you know, in, in the past year, about a year and a half ago, we had Black Lives Matter. Uh, we had the killing of uh, George Floyd in, uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and it became a big issue around the world, even though, you know, we were all uh, uh, locked down during uh, COVID-19. Um, race riots, race protests uh, broke out across uh, North America. And I was really impressed with how many of the protests that I saw on protesters that I saw were younger, non-Black people. They were people that looked like the three of us um, or more like you two because they were younger. Um, and uh, in, in the racial protests of my generation, uh, there weren't many white people involved in those protests. Um, and in the protests lately, uh, there was a lot more, um, a lot more diversity in the color. And I talked to my kids about it and they said that dad, either sometimes they said we're colorblind 
or they said, you know, we just grew up with lots of people from a lot of different uh, backgrounds and, and we're just not nearly, um, we're, we're not racist, we're not prejudiced, we're not, you know, we, we, everyone matters. Uh, Black lives matter and everyone matters to us. Tell me what the two of you thought about that whole um, era in our society, you know, in May, June, July of last year when Black Lives Matter was the big issue. Um, I think, uh, like you said, as there were many young people and uh, people from various backgrounds, I think that was just really encouraging and promising for our future that it shows that um, you don't necessarily have to be directly impacted by a situation to care about it and try to create change. Right, and I think something off that is that um, if we're looking at human rights in general, it's not just about um, the rights that maybe I feel I don't have. Currently, it's about the rights of society as a whole and making sure that every member in society has those human rights. And it's not just about um, one color having those rights or one um, group or sexual orientation having those rights, it's about everyone. Um, being equal. And um, I think that the time last year was very traumatic and um, the things that were happening were awful. Um, and I think it is very important that it wasn't just minorities and that community, it was everyone banding together to stand up for those rights. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau um, made a, a commitment that 50% of his cabinet would be female. We now have a deputy prime minister that is female. We have a vice president in the United States uh, for the first time uh, that's uh, female. Um, how do you feel about women's rights in today's environment? I think um, we as a society have generally made some steps forward, but it's certainly not at equal yet. Um, I think something about feminism that some people don't understand is it's not about asking women to be treated better than men. It's about asking for equality. Um, so things like a woman being a vice president of the United States, it shouldn't be anything new. And it's um, kind of sad that it's such a novelty now because if we were equal, it would have been half and half vice presidents okay, being, <laughs> being female and male. So um I think that, that the novelty of that shows that we do have some room to grow still. And I, I was going to add, I think that it's important that um, I, as much as we want to celebrate the advances we've made, that um, people, for example, in the workforce don't say, like, oh, I don't see male or female, I see an employee. But it's also important to still acknowledge the difference because if we don't acknowledge it then um we won't see what we still need to progress like we won't like aaron said we still need to look at these things and distinguish um to see the cracks in the system to see where we still need uh to improve female like women's rights There's so you think you think you know you've both been successful you've both played hockey at york you've both uh, gone to uh, u of t law school some people think it's a pretty good law school. You both uh, graduated. You're now articling students. You don't think women are treated equally in our society today? I think there's still certain statistics that prove that we aren't. For example, there is still a wage gap in management or supervisory positions in many companies. There's still a great difference in the number of women on board of directors versus men or in um, positions of power. So I think those statistics show that we aren't at equal yet, unfortunately. One of the issues in the last couple of years, not in the last year necessarily, but the last couple of years has been this whole Me Too movement, which uh, was uh, in regards to uh, you know, sexual assault and, uh, and, and, and other issues that uh, some females in the workforce uh, encountered. Um, do you think that's run its course or is it still an issue? The, I think it's still an issue. I think that that movement has been uh, really great at bringing this issue to the surface. I think that a lot of people did not recognize or didn't want to acknowledge how prevalent sexual assault is in our society. I, I heard a statistic that, uh, you know, some outrageous number of females 
have had sexual assault or rape while at college. Yeah. Do you think it really happens? Um, I think where the statistics show or where the stories are coming from, I think we always have to believe the victims or believe the survivors. Um, so I definitely wouldn't call into question their stories. Um, and I think uh, certain things that go on at colleges do um, maybe increase the number of sexual assaults that happen. For example, large parties or um, underage drinking. Um, not to say that that is anyone's fault on the victim's part um, that the sexual assault may occur, but I think that it definitely, those are definitely environments where sexual assault may be more likely to occur. And I think that knowledge is also really important in these situations. I think that a lot of people don't understand what constitutes sexual assault and the wide range of acts that uh, qualify and they are sexual assault. Um, for example, unwanted touching, um, you know, sex where consent is taken back at a later time. I think that people that uh, many people don't understand that that is sexual assault. And I think that universities and colleges are trying to advance education around consent. Um, for example, I know at York, all the first years had to go to a seminar about consent. Um, so I think that there are efforts being made, but I think there is definitely still, again, room for improvement. You know, one of the issues that uh, some people think was uh, resolved decades ago was abortion rights. Um, and the two of you are, are lawyers, and so you probably are, are very knowledgeable about this, but uh, the Supreme Court in the United States is actually uh, dealing with a couple of challenges to uh, Roe v. Wade and uh, and uh, and uh, abortion rights. Um, what do you think is going to happen in the United States? What do you think is going to happen? What should happen in regards to abortion rights? I certainly hope they don't overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, it's a historical and very impactful decision, and I think overturning that would be going back in history in a completely negative way. Um, I think. Canada, we're very lucky to have abortion rights, and I can't foresee such a similar event ever happening here where there could be um, a potential very close to being an overturning of such an important decision um, because abortion rights are, abortions are healthcare and women should have the rights to make decisions over their own body. We've canvassed uh, a lot of issues. Um, I mentioned climate change, neither of you really sort of uh, jumped on that one, but uh, uh, tuition and student debt and uh, and women's rights and abortion rights and uh, and Black Lives Matter uh, have all been topics that uh, you're interested in. What 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 other issues do you think are important to uh, to youth your age, to young people your age? Um, I think it's related to. COVID, so we, but we haven't directly touched on it. I think that another issue is um, vaccines. I know that there's some hesitancy in all age groups, but I think that um, that's really important to our generation as we're like, like things we already talked about, we're entering the workforce. Um, our social lives are very important to us. Some of our generation are just graduating university and children or students a little bit younger than us are just entering university and they're not going to have the university and undergrad experiences that a lot of us had because of COVID and um, vaccine rollout. And I think, especially with the holidays approaching, um, vaccines are a very hot topic in many families. Um, because there are um, differences of opinions within families and trying to get together in some ways for the holidays is difficult when um, parts of the family do not have similar beliefs in vaccines that other parts do. So I think um, vaccination is important for our age group, but also um, across the general public, especially right now. Okay, so let's talk about it. So vaccine mandates or vaccine passports. Uh, the yes. federal government has made it uh, mandatory for you to travel 
um, across provincial boundary on airplanes, on trains, et cetera, that uh, you have to have uh, uh, a vaccination. Um, concerts, uh, hockey games, basketball games, you all need to show a vaccine passport. Um, employers, some are demanding that you either have to have a vaccine or you have to have a vaccine and or if you don't prove uh, via test that you're, uh, that you're uh, negative with COVID. What do you think of passports and mandates? Right, so I think um, they are very important in ensuring that those of us who are vaccinated are safe at things like hockey games, basketball games, and so those things can continue going into the future. Um, I think vaccine mandates are also important for encouraging people who are not already vaccinated to get the vaccine. I know that we personally know several people who have decided to get the vaccine so they can partake in those activities. Um, and on the employment piece, I think that it will be interesting to see court's decisions going forward because I know that we don't have a straight up decision from a court yet about whether or not um, all vaccine mandates will be allowed. Um, so I think that's still open and up in the air, but I hope, um, that courts don't kind of overturn these mandates because I think we will see a falling back in, um, the vaccination policies that we have, do have currently in workplaces and potentially in other atmospheres. Caitlin, what do you think? Yeah, going off what Aaron said, especially about the events like sporting events or concerts, these are not essential. It's not, no one has a right to these things. I think it is great that we are mandating vaccine at these things. It's not, like I said, these things are not essential. It's not worth nothing. Well, nothing is worth, worth risking the safety and health of others. Um, and I think that the stricter mandates and policies have done a great job at encouraging people to get vaccinated. So the ministers of health in both Ontario and Quebec, uh, some people thought were a couple of months ago going to announce mandates for hospital workers, uh, uh, public health, long-term care, et cetera. And they backed off and they didn't demand mandates, uh, uh, vaccines. What they said is vaccines or tests. Uh, and one of the reasons why is they thought there were a lot of people uh, in the workforces that may not actually show up to work if they had to get the vaccines and they were going to be challenged in uh, in uh, getting the workforce. Um, and then other people said, you guys didn't show leadership. You didn't show backbone. Uh, you uh, capitulated to a uh, vocal small minority and, uh, and you're doing a disservice to the users of the, of the public health system, the, the health system. Um, and you should have demanded vaccinations for people that were in the, the health sector. What do you think? So two points on that. One thing I think is critical in that decision was that we are in a bit of a healthcare crisis. I know we have a shortage of nurses and over the pandemic, um, we were seeing overworked staff. However, looking at it from a legal standpoint, it's interesting because any legal analysis into something like this looks at what's reasonable in the circumstances, which would be based upon the need to have a vaccine mandate. And in something like a healthcare situation, there is a greater need because you are dealing with people who are at risk. You are dealing with many people. So a vaccine mandate may be more um, so we call it legal in that atmosphere rather than some place where it might not have such an impact on other people's health and safety. We're chatting tonight with Caitlin and Aaron Lee, uh, two uh, young people that have just uh, graduated from U of T Law School, have uh, started articling jobs in, uh, in Toronto um, and uh, are representing to us, uh, you know, what young people are all about. In today's, uh, in today's world and some of their challenges in the past and some of their hopes for the future. We're going to take a break and come back with uh, just a few last uh, questions uh, in a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Well, I'm having a lot of fun tonight chatting with Caitlin and Erin Lee, uh, two young ladies that uh, are articling students. Uh, they graduated from UT Law School. They're both uh, hockey players. They grew up in small town uh, Ontario. And uh, they're pretty articulate uh, um, and uh, very capable representatives of their uh, generation. Um, the two of you I know have got an interesting and a slightly different story 
uh, in regards to sexual orientation and uh, and uh, and uh, LGBT, sorry, two uh, S LGBTQ plus rights. Right. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get that terminology right. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, Right. Um, so Caitlin and I, our family consists of obviously the two of us and our two moms who are gay. And um, they uh, also involved our father in um, kind of our story. And he's also gay. Um, but our family, uh, our nuclear or immediate family would, has always been considered the four of us being us and our two moms. Um, so we've grown up in a very um, 2S LGBTQ plus friendly home, obviously. Um, and it's also a very loving home for us. Now, you know, I can imagine that in, um, in downtown Toronto, but in Maydock, was that a challenge? How did people react to you? Um, well, our biological mom grew up in Madoc and we have lots of family there. So I think that made it easier. They were, and our family is still, that we know of the only gay family in Madoc and their surrounding area. Uh, that was definitely challenging at times, especially when we first moved there. People weren't always accepting or friendly. Um, I think now that we've been there, for 25 years almost that people have grown to know us and know our family. And that way we've always been great community members and great, represent great representatives of the 2S LGBTQ plus community. So I think that has definitely helped. Um, one thing that our family, both my parents and Aaron and I have noted that we always felt like we had to perform, not perform as in the sense we had to um, represent ourselves or meet this bar of being a good family to be accepted that I don't think a lot of other families feel that need to uh, be socially accepted in their community. Really? That's interesting. So you think the bar was sort of slightly higher for you because of having two moms? I think we always felt the pressure of needing to represent a gay family well. I know um, for our age group growing up in school, I think it was very normalized because of us for there to be such thing as a gay family. But I think in the community in general, we always felt like we, because we were the gay family, um, we wanted to put our best selves forward and represent the community well. You say that um, in such a, you know, an interesting manner, the gay family, is that what you referred to yourself as, or did people refer to you as? Um, I'm not sure how other people refer to us. Um, we, yeah, gay family is fine yeah. for us. Yeah. I always liked the word gay. I thought it's, it's a good attitude to, to have in life. Is. <laughs> um, so given that, what do you think is happening in Canada in small town, Ontario and Toronto to uh, attitudes toward uh, uh, to us LGBTQ plus people, families, rights? I think that um, it's definitely getting better in terms of acceptance, which I don't really even like the word acceptance because I think that it shouldn't just be, the difference shouldn't be accepted or just, I think it should be something that's celebrated. Acceptance is almost like condoned. It doesn't, it just doesn't sit right. Um, I think that in our case, something I feel is that our community and um, like our peers, the people we grew up with are good towards us because they know us and they like our family. I think there's still um, issues with um, homophobia in general, like using uh, gay slang. Um, I think that's still an issue and not um, putting or considering gay rights, for example, when you vote or when you're considering uh, political platforms, I think that's still a really big issue. I think the two of you are incredible representatives of, uh, of your generation, 
And uh, I'm looking yeah. forward to spectacular things from you too in the future. And uh, anytime you guys want to reach out and, uh, and argue something with me, please give me a call and we'll uh, have you on our show again. It's a pleasure been chatting with you. And uh, I think your two moms have done a spectacular job in raising you and you guys have done a great job of uh, educating yourself and furthering yourself and uh, setting yourselves up for a great future. Good luck. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Well, that's our show for tonight. Two very impressive young ladies. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everybody.